Well, good morning, everyone. Some of you didn't sound like you meant that. That's all right. Um, anyway, uh, let's see what I have here for us. Things we enjoy as followers of Jesus. How about that? Could you come up with a list? Or do you have to kind of think about it for a second? Things that you enjoy. I mean, not, I'm not talking about I enjoy the hope I have of forgiveness and eternal life. That's great. What are some things that you enjoy as a follower of Jesus? Kind of thing. Well, I do this because I follow Jesus. Peace. You do peace? You have peace. Okay, so let me, before I embarrass this young man anymore, things that you do. Not things that you necessarily feel. Uh, okay, I for, forgive me. Whoever that. Fellowship. All right, you do fellowship. Finally, so okay, good. If you do fellowship, you enjoy that. You enjoy fellowship. Good. What else do you do that you enjoy? Because you're a, you do it because you're a follower of Jesus. You may not do it if you didn't believe in Jesus or didn't have a relationship with Him and and want to uh, build on that relationship. So fellowship, anything else that we do or you do, that this is something I do as a follower of Jesus, and I like it. Yeah. What's that? Giving. Giving. Giving? Do we all? Oh, I was going to get the offering plate that, out real quick to get it to this guy. I heard something. Giving? Prayer. Giving yourself. Prayer? Enjoy prayer. Okay. Having somebody to talk to that you really believe is there. Good. Worship, you enjoy singing and giving your heart to God. What else do you enjoy? Living with integrity. Living with integrity. I like it, living with integrity. Living with hope. Living with hope. Helping others. Helping others. Potlucks. What's that? <laughs> potlucks. <laughs> Jesus endorsed potlucks, you know that. He, he, anytime somebody invited him over for a meal, it was like, I'm there. Seems like it anyway. Anything else? Bringing someone to Christ. Really? Because that's where I'm going with this here. How about that? And I didn't even talk to him about that. Because this is, this is who you are in a sense. I mean, you're a child of God. But God is saying, you're not only a child of God, you are something else to me. And, and it's out of Acts chapter 1-8. It says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And that means Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, uh, a part of the triune person of God. He comes and he, he indwells in you. When you receive Christ your Savior, you have the Holy Spirit in you. He gives you power to do what? And, and that's what we want to talk about today. He says, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So going back to my original question here, what are some of the things that you enjoy doing because you're a follower of Christ? And I don't want anybody to sit there and say, in, to get up and say, yeah, I don't necessarily enjoy this thing too much. I think we do, but then again, it causes what in us when we know that I'm to be a witness? Anxiety. Anxieties. Fear. Fear. Stress. Stress, stressed out, yeah. Those are real things that happen. And uh, I would think that most of us here would probably say, yeah, I get that. And that's why we have this idea, not the idea, this promise that you will receive power. Because can you imagine if Jesus, this, this incredibly important thing about being able to say, I'm a different person and I want to be a witness to Jesus Christ because he's the one that made me a different person. And I want to, I want to demonstrate that to people. I want to share that with people. Uh, but you're left on your own to do it. I mean, fear, anxieties, stressing out, uh, not really wanting to see some people go to heaven because they're jerks. You know, that kind of thing can happen maybe, I don't know. 
but this isn't something that we really put at the top of the list of things that I enjoy about being a follower of Jesus. Now, quite frankly, it's one of the things I do enjoy. I, 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 I do, and maybe I'm weird, but I think some of you might also, uh, but it's not something at the top of our list of something we want to do. And yet, as a follower of Jesus Christ, it's something that we are called. I mean, you are a witness. It's not something, he doesn't say, you will become, I will make you into one, although that's implied here, but he's saying, this is something you hang around your neck as a sign, a witness. Your life is a witness. Your, your, your words are a witness. Your love towards others is because of Jesus Christ and you are witnessing his love for you. When you show mercy, when you show love, when you, when you give of yourself to other people, you are doing it because you have received that from Jesus and you are being a, a testimony to something. When you're called into a court of law as a witness, you're called because you actually encountered something. They don't call you to be a witness if you weren't there at the scene of the crime or had not any knowledge. If you had nothing to, to add that was truthful, you would never be called into a court of law. But this here is like this world that you live in, your community, your neighborhood, your place of work, even within your home, is a court of law in a sense because you are there to give testimony to what you know to be truthful. And we're gonna talk about this today as being followers of Jesus Christ. And here's what I wanna really wanna to say to you is that when we think of witnessing, all of a sudden, we're, this is what we're afraid of. You know, great, you know, he's gonna put me in downtown Chicago on Michigan Avenue and I'm gonna to have to wear this sign, this shirt that says stop sinning and I'm gonna have a Bible in my hand and as people come by, I'm gonna point a finger at them and tell them, you know, you're going to go to hell. Maybe that's what God will have you do. I don't know. I'm not, here to, I'm not here to criticize whoever this man is, if it's a real thing, but that's not me. When I was uh, going to Moody Bible Institute and I had to take a class in evangelism, one of the things I had to do before the semester was over, I had to witness to three strangers and it was very uncomfortable and I remember being downtown in Chicago walking around stopping at a bus stop or people waiting for a bus. I didn't do this but I had to start a conversation tell somebody about Jesus and then it was a train ride back from uh, well it was a northwestern station back and then what's it called now? Doesn't matter. <laughs> to, to, back to Wheaton where Robin, my wife and I were living and I got on a guy waiting on the get on the train and I started talking to him about Jesus and this and this and he kind of looked at this and he took one of the upper chairs to get away from me and I followed him and I sat right next to him or right across from him and I kept on and he couldn't wait to get off that train I thought he was going to jump before it came to a stop <laughs> if that's not me and I'm not sure that's you um, or this here we have this fear of uh, again you know oh my goodness Jesus is going to make me wear this sandwich board kind of a sign about Jesus saves. I'm not saying that this guy is wrong because I don't know him and if God put upon his heart to do that, he needed to do that, but God hasn't put that on my heart and I'm thankful he has. That's not who I am and who I want to be as a witness. Or how about this here, you know, but he's going to send me to India and if he does, you need to go. And I admire this woman. This is a shot obviously from a century ago and in India, a missionary, uh, God bless her, and she's going to have rewards, and that's the love of her life. Some of us feel like, oh my goodness, you know, he's going to send me to the some jungle, deep, dark thing, and and uh, that's not who I, I don't want to go there or whatever. But if he sends you there, he'll make you. He'll put it in your heart to go there, and you'll want to go. But that's not most of us, is it? Or this here. You ever have these guys, not necessarily these two guys, but they come to your door, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Mormons, and they're going to, they're, they're required, the church requires Mormons, good Mormons, to spend so many hours or days or years as missionaries. And they go knocking on door to door, they go to other countries. And uh, Did Jesus put that on your heart? 
to do that? What would you do? Would, could you go to somebody's door and knock and have a Bible in your hand and say, hey, I'm from such and such church? P churches still do that. It's not as effective as I, other ways and what, what I'm going to share with you, okay? So anyway, it, this is sometimes why we have these this stress, these anxieties, this fear about being a witness is because we, we think we have to become some unnatural robotic person who's got to do that which is not within my personality it's not something i i'm comfortable doing uh, is there a better way and i'm going to say i'm i think there is i think there is a natural way and this is not a natural way this isn't something we do uh, like selling fuller brushes you know door-to-door -door vacuum cleaners and things like that but we're going to talk about this but to begin with, we've been talking last three, two weeks, and today will be our third week, is what a disciple is. Anybody remember something about it? As a learner. By the way, I have books, and some of you too, that, that are thick books telling you what a disciple is. And it's like overwhelming, and I, I simplify it because I'm a simple thinking person, and I, I like things that are easy to understand. So a disciple is a learner. What else? A what? A student, a follower. Uh, so here it is. He's one who follows Jesus, one who learns from Jesus. Okay, very simple. Follow Jesus, learn from Jesus. The third thing I, I like to, this helps me understand it, is one who's being changed by Jesus. So they become like Jesus. Very simple. Okay, do you learn from Jesus? Do you follow him and, and, and live your life as, as uh, he lived in kindness and generosity and kingdom-minded? And do you want to be transformed from the inside out? Then you're a follower of Jesus. So today we're going to be talking about this part of uh, being a, a disciple and following Jesus is that you're going to be a witness for him. You're going to be a witness. We're going to be in John. John chapter 1. So grab a Bible. There should be, there is one in the seat in front of you, hopefully, or one next to you. I'm on page 886, John chapter 1. And, and we're going to look at this idea of natural, can I say natural evangelism? By the way, the word evangelism means one who prom, or, or proclaims good news, speaks good news. Okay, we have good news to share to people. And if you think about that, uh, we experienced it. Why wouldn't we want others to have that knowledge and enjoy that experience of knowing Jesus Christ also? And I want to share with you today how the earliest followers of Jesus Christ became witnesses in a very natural way that they seemed to just flow right into and it didn't seem to be that difficult at all not nearly as difficult as sometimes we think it is. We're gonna begin by saying, first thing is, you, as a follower of Jesus Christ, have to come to Jesus, and I'm not talking about receiving him as your savior, which obviously you need to do, receive him as savior and Lord, but I mean, you need to come to him to saturate your life with him if you want to be able to share with others that experience. You can't give to people you can't give to people what you don't first possess, right? You have to have an ownership of this. And so let's begin here. Here's the background. This is the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. Uh, he comes to his cousin, John the Baptizer, and he is baptized by Jesus. I mean, Jesus is baptized by John, and at that time, uh, this the Holy Spirit lands upon Jesus like a dove, or in the form of a dove, and that was a sign to John that this was the Messiah, the Lamb of God. And so we pick it up here because the next day, uh, John points out to people, there is a, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of so the world. And then the following day, he does the exact same thing again. And that's where I want to pick it up, verse 35. And in this, we're going to see what his earliest followers did before they became witnesses for him. Put my glasses on here. Beginning at verse 35. 
The next day again, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, Come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. So the tenth hour in, in Jewish time uh, would begin, the, the hour of the day became at sunrise, 6 a.m., so this is probably, what, ten hours after that would make it what? Four o'clock. Okay, so let's just assume it's around four o'clock. Uh, but, but the thing that's interesting here is, is these people were actually looking for the Messiah. They were disciples of John the Baptist, okay? And they were looking for the Messiah. They were looking for God to come, his kingdom. And, and John the Baptist pointed out, see, there he is. There's the Lamb of God. And so in their hunger and their desire to know this person, uh, I'm sure it was kind of strange because um, there was no you know, majestic pomp or, or, or uh, celebration of when Jesus came, and, but they still had this curiosity. They're still searching. So these two begin to follow Jesus, all right? And Jesus knows they follow him, and he turns, seeing them following, and, and said to them, what do you seek? What is it that you want in life? You know, that is a great question to ask people. And actually, we need to begin by asking ourselves this question. What is it that you really want in life? I mean, you think about it, and you say, well, I, I want a good career. And that's a good thing to want. Or I want a good friendship, or I want a, a, a good marriage, or, or I want to have a family, or I want a car that doesn't break down. And, and those things can be very good things, but the question is, why do you want those things? What is it about those things that are going to bring something into your life that is missing? And I'm going to suggest to you, it's, there's substitutes for whom Christ it can be in our lives. And I'm going to get to that in a minute here. So Jesus says, what are you seeking in life? And, and they say to him, well, rabbi, which means when translated, teacher, where are you staying? Now, what is it that they really wanted to know? Or what did they really, you know, were they thinking, I want your address? Uh, can I have your phone number so I can text you kind of a thing? What, what do you think they were really wanting? They, they wanted to know who he was. Yeah, I, to, to, to say, where are you staying, is basically saying, I want to know more about you. Uh, our master, our teacher, John the Baptist, says, you're the Lamb of God. You take away the sins of the world. You're the Messiah. Uh, not quite what I thought you'd look like, but tell me more about you. I want to spend some time with you. And so uh, he says, well, come and see. He invites him, yeah, you can stay with me. Come and takes him into his home. It's about the 10th hour. Uh, and they came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. And again, the 10th hour, about 4 o'clock. I don't know if they spent the night with him. They could very likely have had dinner with him, spent the night and slept in, in the home with him and got up the next morning and went on their way. But they, the point I want to make here is that witnessing to Jesus Christ begins with him witnessing to us. And we have to avail ourselves to that, and we have to actually hunger for it. And we're going to see who these two disciples were, at least one of them by name, and that he had a, a real hunger for Jesus. And so if, if you're not hungry for Jesus, you're not going to be an effective witness to Jesus, and people are going to see right through that. You know, well, I used to sell cars. I have this reputation of, you know, Two careers I've had, one was very, very short, uh, things that people don't always trust, and one was I was a used car salesman. The other one is I was a pastor. You know, can you trust this guy? <laughs> you know, they're out to get you, is this kind of thing here. Um, if, if I wanted to be effective as a car salesman, I had to win people's trust over and, and I, I learned how to do that by just listening to them and caring about them and things like that. 
and, and that gave me a doorway into their what their needs were and I could bring them to that but I had to know the product of the car I was selling them because they would see through it if they were a sharp person and you know well, well uh, how, how, what does this button here do so well, I don't know where's a manual you know I'm gonna lose them right then and there they're gonna lose confidence with me right how, uh, how do you um, do this with the car how does this uh, program work or how does that work or what's the horsepower of the car does it have rear wheel uh, disc brakes or just front wheel disc brakes and uh, all these questions they had for me I needed to be ready to answer them if I wanted to win their confidence over just a simple illustration folks that our effectiveness to sharing Christ with people is going to be related to our experiencing him ourselves and that's what these disciples did they came and spent the time with them do you do we spend enough time with Jesus is the question well I go to church on Sundays that's a good thing to do that's it's a something God commands us to do to gather together and be there for one another and to worship him together and to listen to his word but what about the rest of the week do we spend time getting to know him do we have a, a in our hearts, I want to spend time with you because I want to know you. I want you to, I want to experience you. I want to have confidence in you. Here's the thing is, Jesus makes this promise. I know this is Old Testament, Jeremiah chapter 29, but that's still Jesus talking. It's still God speaking. And even in the Old Testament times, he makes this promise. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. And there are people out there who say, I don't see God, I don't see the evidence of God. And, and I would say, what are you looking for? And they might say, well, I'm looking for you know, him to solve all the misery in this world and he's not doing it, so therefore I don't see him. Or, or something like that. And I would say to them or encourage them to say, you're looking for an interpretation of what God ought to be doing. You're not really looking for him as a person. And if you will look for him wholeheartedly, you'll find him. And if you want to experience Christ in a more deeper sense, and if you're more diligent about wanting to know Christ in your life, he will, he will acquiesce. He will, he will be what you are looking for. And I would also say this, again, I'm going to say this a number of times today. People are looking for Jesus. Everyone is. They just don't know it all the time. And what do I mean by that? They're looking for things that they, they're looking for meaning and purpose in life. They're looking for fulfillment in life. They're looking for peace, a sense of value in life. And they're looking for uh, security and safety. They're looking for people to love them and to know them. And ultimately, you know, God created you to find those things outside of yourself, okay? God created each and every one of us to find value, meaning, and purpose, and security outside of ourselves. But it was meant to be with Him. But instead, where do we find it? Oh, our possessions that we might have, this thing, a bigger thing, a nicer thing. Um, people, I, when I first heard this statement, I, it took me back. But I read it, and the more I thought about it, I agree with it. A man, and I'm going to pick on a man, who walks into an adult bookstore, and you know what I mean by an adult bookstore, right? Sexual fantasies and stuff like that. A man who walks into that store is looking for Jesus, and he doesn't know it. Now, you think about that. Why, why can I make that statement? And that's not my statement. Somebody else who, who I, I read in. But why is that a true statement? Because something's missing in his life. There's a hole in his life. And he's lonely. He's frustrated. He's insecure in relationships, whatever it is. He's looking to have something met that only God can meet. He's looking for Jesus, what Jesus could do for him. But he's looking for it in the wrong ways. And I would suggest that for all of us, too. When you are hungry for something, is it for that thing you're hungry for? Or are you really just hungry for what Jesus can bring? And that's what a follower of Jesus does. 
If you want to be an effective witness, and I know you do, let Jesus experience him on a day-to-day thing. If you look for him wholeheartedly, you'll find him. The other thing here is once we do that, we're ready to start bringing people to Jesus. Let's continue with this. Uh, Read the next nine verses here. Beginning in verse 40. One of the two heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means uh, Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, Come and see. What is remarkable about this here is this sense of uh, importance that these new disciples felt immediately, and that is once they'd found who they were looking for, they wanted others to know this person too or to come to him. But but who did they go to? And, And think about that for a second. And the first thing Andrew did was find his brother Simon. Simon was, uh, uh, and he told him, we have found the Messiah. You know, and, and he did, he did. He, he found him because he was searching for him. But he goes to the person whom would be easiest for him to share this with. He doesn't go to the Samaritans. He doesn't go to even other Jews. He, he goes to his brother. And why did he go to his brother first? Well, I mean, in, in one sense, I, I think, well, it's his brother whom he loved. They were not just grew up together. Uh, they were fishing partners. They had a business together with their father, and, and he, uh, so they, they were close and things like that. But it, it certainly implies something to me, and that is Peter was also one who was seeking the Messiah, and Andrew goes to him first. So when you think about who you want to share this news with, your experience with Jesus Christ, who comes to your mind? Who who, who ought to come to mind first? Family, friends. If you have a um, wedding list, say you're getting married and you start filling out the guest list, um, who goes on that guest list first? Mom and dad. Family, they go first. Why is that? Because they come to your mind first of greatest importance. And, and, and you also call, uh, put them on the list because you know they're going to come, right? And I just want to share that with you because it's a natural thing if we just think about those who are close to us. And if God's saying, I want you tonight or today, this afternoon, in your mind, or even do it literally, get a piece of paper out and write down names of people who are important to you. People that you care about, people who know you and trust you. And they may be Christians already. That, don't worry about whether they're saved or not. Just write down a list of those of greatest importance to you. And you say, well, I'm supposed to love everybody equally. No, hold on. You can love some people closer that are more important to you than others it's okay all right but write down that list and then ask yourself where are these people in their journey with christ do they know him are they engaged with him are they fully engaged with them well they maybe they know him as a savior but they're not really engaged with in the christian community that's something that you need to say okay god you have given me a mission or if they don't know christ and you start at that top of the list. People, why, why is that to your advantage? You, you already know them, and I hope you have a trusting relationship with them, right? I hope it isn't that, you know, well, I haven't spoken to my brother for 43 years. That can happen at times. I get it. But more often than not, these people, if you walked in their life and said, I've got to share something with you, it's important. They're going to say, okay, what's going on? And what do you tell them about? 
spending time with Jesus and the work that he's doing in your life and what he's done for you. So Jesus is in Galilee and he finds Philip and he tells Philip, come and follow me. And Philip follows him, learns more about Jesus. And Philip goes and finds Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. What is interesting about this here is that he goes, now Nathanael isn't related to Philip, uh, but he goes to Nathanael because he knows that Nathanael is a seeker. What do I mean by that? He's a person who is also looking for the Messiah. And we, we understand that because he's talking about uh, Moses wrote about him in the law. The prophets wrote about him. And we have found the one that these two had wrote about. And Nathanael is aware of these things. When, when Paul, the Apostle Paul, uh, went on his missionary journeys, what is interesting is that he would go to places that he knew people would be hunger, hungry for the Lord. He goes to one city and he hears that there's a, a group of people by the river who's, who pray. So what does he do? He doesn't go to, the, you know, to strangers. He goes to that place where people are already demonstrating a hunger for the Lord. And he meets this woman called Lydia, named Lydia, and leads her to faith in Christ. When, why did he go to that place? Because he knew these were true people who were hungering for the Lord. Again, it's a natural thing. It's an easier thing to do. It's not standing on the corners with this sandwich board saying, you know, uh, Gee, the Lord is returning and, you know, if you don't receive and believe, you're going to be judged and end up in hell. It's, uh, it's not that kind of mission. It's going where God is already preparing people's hearts. Jesus, uh, uh, or Paul goes to a city and he goes to the marketplace. And the marketplace was uh, Aragopagus. Did I say that right? Ariopagus. Thank you. He always helps me out here. And, and that's where people shared ideas. That's where people talked about philosophies and religions and things. And he goes there because he knew he could speak there and people would listen to him. Okay, And again, that's the idea that we're learning from this passage is that we don't need to complicate it. We need to understand that there are, ease, there are doors that are already open in our life. Uh, Nathaniel says to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said, come and see. What, I don't know what the problem with the Nazareths were, but apparently they had a reputation that you know, like a, a city or, or people that were just kind of uh, weird, uh, stupid people, ignorant people, and Nathaniel didn't have a good view of these people. And uh, Jesus was, grew up in Nazareth as a boy, and uh, Nathaniel said, you know, really somebody out of, God would take somebody out of Nazareth? I don't think so. You know what this reminds me of? is when we go, hey, you should come to church, and I say, really? Church, you know, not me. I've tried that before. Nothing good out of it. They're a bunch of hypocrites. All they want is your money. They have all these rules and they judge you and uh, they're full of pedophiles and misogynists and uh, all these negative thoughts. And, and what do you say to them? Come and see. That's not my experience. So when you, we don't have to convince people that Jesus is God. It's not our job. It's not our job to convince people that Jesus died on the cross for their sins. It's not our job. It's not our job to convince people that if you follow Jesus Christ, he will make a positive impact on your life. He'll give you love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control. That fruit of the Spirit will become more and more of your life. It's not our job to convince people of that. Right? It's all our job is to say, come and see for yourself. God is the one who does the convincing, right? That's all. I don't have to convince you the Bible is true. Did you know that there are a couple well-known people in the world who, have, uh, who are atheists or non-believers, and they, they go out of their way to prove, they're, they're going to do some research and they're going to demonstrate to people that this whole New Testament thing is, is a fallacy. 
don't believe it. One man, his name was Lee Strobel. Anybody familiar with him? Uh, Lee Strobel, okay, he wrote this. He's wrote a couple books, The Case for Christ. And what he did, his wife was a believer, he was not, and he was just kind of challenged. Hey, do your research. So he did his research. He, he read the Bible, okay. But then he went to all these uh, people, these scholars, and talked to them about research and how we got to the New Testament and, and did all this kind of work over the years. And he comes to the fact of saying, it's, it's true. All he was invited to do is come and see for yourself. Great book if you want to read it. It's for there. But here, here's what I also wanted to share with you today is this is a, a little New Testament uh, of the Gospel of John, and we have these books out there. Sometimes, not sometimes, but when you engage people over time and you get to know them and understand what their struggles are, you want to say to them, come and see. So how do you do that? What do you want them to do? Oh, it might be just come to church with me and just see, see if it does if it's what I say it is. Or maybe just here, just take this and you, you told me you're not sure about this, Jesus. Just read this little book here and let Jesus tell you who he is. In fact, in the beginning of this book here, is what can be helpful for many of us, I know you can't read this, but the, the first couple pages tell us what it means to lead people to Jesus Christ in faith. And even if you just read that, you're going to feel more comfortable in dialoguing with people. But to get them into the Word of God, just here it is, the Gospel of John. Read it. Come and see Jesus for yourself. Now, if you have built a... Fr you're not talking about a stranger. I know that some people can go to a... Uh, out to eat, and they're going to give this to the waitress. And, and if God puts that upon your heart, do it. Or you go to the checkout, and and you're paying your, your, for your groceries. Oh, by the way, I've got this for you. They're going to probably say, oh, okay, thank you, and roll their eyes. Or maybe, they, maybe they're going to say, well, I've been looking for that. I don't know. You do what the Spirit of God has put upon your heart to do as far as sharing the Word of God. What I'm saying here is, if I had a choice between giving this to a stranger or giving it to somebody I know who knows me, I'm going to go to this person first. I'm not ignoring that stranger but I'm going to go to somebody who trusts me and say, listen, this is what it's done for me. And they're going to believe me, hopefully. And that's what Andrew and Philip are doing here. They're going to those people they know and care about. Let Jesus do his work. And that's basically what we're saying here. When, what it all comes down to is this here, that you're not there to convince people you're there to lead them to christ so he can do the convincing we read the story here jesus saw uh, philip took nathaniel to meet jesus verse 47 jesus saw nathaniel coming toward him and said to him behold an israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit nathaniel said to him how do you know me jesus answered him before philip called you when you were under the fig tree i saw you and Nathanael answered, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. And Jesus answered him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will have greater things, you will see greater things than these. And he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Let's just kind of look at these verses uh, briefly together here. He sees Nathanael, and, and he says, an Israelite in no deceit. Now, what he's saying, a true Israelite, the people of Israel were those who had a covenant, believing relationship of Jesus Christ. But many of them did not. And they weren't really, in the spiritual sense, true Israel, Israelites, because they were caught up in legalism and obeying the law and things like this. And in that sense, they were deceitful. They were pretending. They were play actors, pretending to be followers of Yahweh or Jehovah, but they weren't. And here's Nathaniel, and Jesus says, there is a true Israelite. He is sincere. He is he's honest. He's truly seeking me out. And Nathaniel says, well, uh, how do you know me? And he says, before Philip called you, when you're under the fig tree, I saw you. So he revealed a supernatural understanding of who Nathaniel was. And he revealed it to Nathaniel. Nathaniel says, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, the King of Israel. It was enough for him because God had revealed something to him, spoken to him in such a way that 
Philip, who brought him to Jesus, could not say to him. And that's what I'm getting at here. If you can bring people to Christ, get them into the word, get them into, if, they, if they're willing to come to church and listen to worship and see the love that people, God is bringing into our lives, the Spirit of God can work on their hearts. And Jesus answered, because, uh, you, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? And shall, you shall see greater things than these. And he says, truly, truly, I say to you, you shall see heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. When he was under the fig tree, most biblical scholars think Nathaniel was recalling that picture in the Old Testament when Jacob was running from his brother Esau and was going to another land. He was sleeping out in the desert at night, put a rock under his head, and he had this dream of these angels coming down this ladder and then going back up the ladder. Angels are messengers. It was the messengers of God giving God revelation. If Nathaniel was thinking about this, what Jesus is saying here is you're going to see angels on the Son of Man. He was the ultimate revelation of God. You're going to see, it's a figurative way of saying what Jacob had is nothing compared to what you're going to see. You're going to see the revelation of God. That's what I want to share, end up with, folks, and that is, God, or Jesus is the ultimate revelation of who God is. If we can bring people to just come and meet with him, just wholeheartedly, tr just be honest with him and be sincere and let the word of God just speak to you and you can see God at work. There's no guarantee, but it's what God has called us to do. And evangelism is not telling people what they must do with God. Okay? It's telling people what God has done for them. Okay? It's this. God sent his son to die for you. What do I have to do? Just know that he sent his son to die for you. And believe and receive. Just know that. Well, don't I have to go to church? Well, that would be a good, helpful thing. Do I need to read my Bible? I would certainly encourage it. Strongly encourage it. Do I need to give to the church? Money, well, that's up to you and God. But all I want to share with you is not what you must do, but what God has done for you. That's what evangelism really is. Telling people the good news, what God has done for them. Father, thank you so much. Thank you for your truth. Thank you you saved us. And thank you that we can be followers of Jesus. There's nothing more important in this eternity, Father, than people to come to know you so that they can find eternal hope, forgiveness of sin, eternity, and also find meaning and purpose and value in life because they come to you and understand that that's what we're here for, to know our God and to know our Savior and to experience his love and fellowship with him. Help us to be, Father, to lead people, to witness to people, to share with people, and let us do it within the comfort, Father, of our personality, but doesn't mean we're always going to be comfortable doing it, Father. So give us courage, give us strength, and give us a conviction to do what you've called us to do with the power of the Holy Spirit in us. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.